I, uh, I went to school as an undiagnosed dyslexic. And dyslexic. And, and the teacher said, Paul's lazy, or Paul, Paul doesn't do his work, or Paul, whatever. And the upshot of the story was is that I thought, you know, I, I was in the dummy class. And I thought that, uh, well, I had a difficult time in school. Couldn't read, couldn't spell. So my dad, I brought home information from the guidance counsel's office about a vocational school. And I said, Pop, I'm thinking about being a machinist. Now, this was in 1960, 1960 when being a machinist was a good trade. He looked at it and said, that's a good trade, son. He opened up the brochure. And he saw a scientific class going, that's what you want to do. Said, well, what do they do? <laughs> and my dad is a chemist. So he got so excited about scientific class going that he took me to Salem Vocational Technical School the next day, and I enrolled in the course. And I worked for 10 years as a scientific class boy. And but I always wanted to be on the creative side. And in 1965, Woman's Day magazine came out with an issue dedicated to paperweights. Antique French paperweights of Europe and also American paperweights. When I saw that magazine, because I knew about the South Jersey paperweights, and I was intrigued by them. Supposedly it was a loss of art. And when I saw that magazine, that became my dream. I wanted to make paperweights. So in 1969, while I was working in Scientific Glass Point, I started experimenting with full paperweights. And this is an example from 1972, probably. And I want to show you the process. And I take commercially available colored glasses and clear glass and shape the colored glasses in a flame, a gas oxygen flame, uh, to make the petals, the leaves, the stems, the insects. It's interesting because that flame is about, uh, at the hottest point, was about 3,500 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And glass melts at 1,600 to uh, 2,000. So I'm, I'm making a flower. And I'm shaping out the, uh, the petals and the sepals. And now I'm going to make uh, the stamens. I've incorporated human forms into my botanical designs. And uh, they're symbols. They're symbols of, of uh, energy under the earth. And this is a brown, black brown glass. And I'm making a leg. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to, I'm going to uh, put a little bridge on and then shape the upper torso. Now these little human forms uh, add to the... Uh, they're ambiguous, you know. I like to incorporate these human forms into the design and have people discover them and wonder who, what What's going on here? <laughs> and from the paperweights, I uh, developed uh, a new form, a new format for my flowers that I call the mechanical series. And what's interesting about this format, I would be, I'm able to take the equivalent of four paperweights and over the course of two or three days, build it into a, a larger format. And when I left the industry in 19, uh, February of 72, and, and the radio became one of my uh, companions. So I would turn on Phil Donahue on the radio while I was working and listening to the show. Well, here's Bruce Jenner talking about as a, as a, a grammar school student having dyslexia and how he wasn't able to read, and how he channeled all of his energy into sports. 
And he's talking about being a dyslexic. And I'm thinking, my God, he's talking about me. And that was the first time that I realized I wasn't stupid. I was dyslexic. And so I started listening to books on tape. In 1965, I hit this invisible wall. I wasn't able to do anything. I was just felt like I was going through the motions. And I was faking it. My work was doing well in the marketplace. And I knew I wasn't making any progress. So I, I was walking in Reading Terminal in Philadelphia, and there was a used book dealer. And I was walking by, and here's the table, and off to the corner of the table was uh, Walt Whitman. It was a biography on Walt Whitman by Justin Kaplan. So I, I bought the book, I got the book on tape, and I read it, and I started writing poetry. And, and I started to celebrate, I started to develop a, a fondness and an appreciation for Whitman's words. And I wanted to share with you a few of his sentences. Give me solitude, give me nature, give me again, O oh nature, your primal sanity. I believe the leaves of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. A morning glory at my window satisfies me more than the metaphysics of books. And the running blackberries would adorn the powers of heaven. And the narrowest tinge in my hand puts to scorn all machinery. When I read that sentence and saw it myself, it was like an epiphany. Here, I had been working with my hands for 30 or 40 years and, and realized, intuitively realized that the hands are a miraculous instrument. Here are the human forms that I incorporate into, the, uh, into my designs. In the studio, we would call them group people. And then that, and, it was, and I was always very protective about what I call my components. It was just a working title in the studio, and then it got out into the, into the world, into the glass world. So now I just call them figures. And then from, from the human forms to the masks, I got tired of making the figures. People wanted to see, they wanted to have my work with the human forms. And I thought, well, let's do something a little different. <coughs> so, turn of the century, I started doing masks. And this is a tribute to, this is not a tribute, this is a, a response to 9-11. So they replaced the human forms. But then I went back to him. This is a <laughs> this is a cloistered botanical, and what I what I what I've discovered is that I can laminate dark green glass on three sides of my block, and it becomes space as opposed to glass. Mm -hmm. And then the golden orb has a flower and a honeybee in the, suspended in the golden orb, and that symbolizes spirituality for me. Spirituality is so essential and significant work. I educated myself, and now I'm an educated person. I'm very proud of that. One of the, one of the courses that I would subscribe to, have you anybody heard of uh, the teaching company? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, uh, it's so wonderful. So I would order, I was a great customer of the teaching company. They would commission university professors to put their lectures on tape. And so I would I would be listening to these lectures. Now I wasn't working when I was listening to them, because I had to think about what I was listening to. So in, in the early morning, I would dedicate an hour, half an hour to an hour. So I had just listened to a, a series of lectures on American transcendentalism. And it talked about Emerson and Thoreau, and actually Walt Whitman was in there. So I was having an exhibition 
in New York City at the Kaplan Gallery on 57th Street. And uh, it was a fancy gallery, and you rang the doorbell, and you went in. So this doorbell rang, very attractive, distinguished woman came in. Said, I noticed you have paperweights in your window. Do you have any of Paul Stanker's paperweights? <laughs> so Susie Kaplan says, not only do we have Paul Stanker's paperweights, I can introduce you to Paul Stanker. <laughs> <laughs> she came in, and she's looking at the work, and she said, I have, I had a paperweight as a child that was, that I still own, it's very precious, and somebody gave me a book on paperweights, and your paperweights were featured in the book. And I was, I was really, admi I admire your, your work. So she was looking at the collection, and she ended up buying an orb. You know, it was a pretty significant purchase. Six eleven dollars. <laughs> pretty good. So, uh, so after she purchased, selected a piece, I said, uh, what's your career? She said, I'm uh, the president of Muskegon College in New Concord, Ohio. And I said, oh, congratulations. <laughs> so then we started talking about, I started talking about transcendentalism and that. And the two of us had this most esoteric conversation <laughs> about the nuances of transcendentalism. And I'm feeling pretty smart. <laughs> I had just taken a course. She was operating from 40 years earlier, uh, 30 years earlier, I don't know. So we had a very, very pleasant conversation. And, and I went home, and end of, end of January, there was a message on the machine. Mr. Stankard, this is Dr. Ann Steele, president of Muskegon College. Would you consider being a uh, uh, graduate speaker for the Masters of Fine, uh, Masters of Fine Art, oh, Masters of Art Education? And I'm listening to that recording, and I said, Pat, God, I, can't, I couldn't do that. No, you can do it, Paul. Go ahead and try it. I thought about it. I thought, you know, you really shouldn't, you should never give in to what you're afraid of. Really. You should just push through. So I said, okay, I'll accept this. Accepted the invitation. I had just finished writing this book. So I thought, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about being an artist. I'll talk about my challenges and the obstacles I experienced as a poor student. I got a hold of my grammar school grades, and they had my IQ down as 78. <gasps> no wonder they didn't pay any attention to me. <laughs> so anyway, I wrote, I wrote this heartfelt talk, and the publisher of uh, McDonald Woodward Publishing Company, the president of the company, graduated from the skate kind of synchronism. So he came to hear, to hear this talk. Now I'm from New Jersey. This publishing house of the skate was in Ohio. So after my presentation, it was a 20 minute presentation, and I had it memorized. Because I don't read. I read, but I don't read. But I could, but I had, I had in my peripheral vision, I had a 28 font, you know, every, every four lines of a slip on the page. So uh, they gave me a standing ovation. And Jerry McDonald, president of McDonald uh, Woodward Publishing Company, said, Paul, I'm stopping the publication of your book. We're going to, I want you to put that speech in the first chapter. I said, okay. <laughs> so the book was, it was scheduled to be published in the uh, middle of May 2007. He put it on hold. I, I worked it into the first chapter and, uh, and not only were the glass community interested in my, my bio, autobiography, but the learning disability people were inviting me to speak. And uh, anyway, I'm sorry. You know what? I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Storyteller. 